Data shows quakes have not only become more frequent over the past century, likely due to the improvements in earthquake detection technology, but are also causing much more destruction due to the growing population and construction densities. Nepal is so vulnerable to quakes due to its location. The latest, an earthquake of magnitude 6.4 struck western Nepal on Friday night, resulting in the death of at least 140 and over a dozen injuries. The tremors were so big that they were felt over 600 kilometers away, including Delhi and CR, which is 600 kilometers away from the epicenter. This is not the first time that quakes have caused misery and destruction or to happen in this region. They are actually on the rise. So what's causing them and what do you need to do when they hit your country or region and you're not prepared for it? And are they becoming more frequent? And why are they becoming more frequent? Let's now talk to Professor Carlo Doglioni, who is the president of the Geophysical and Volcanological Institute, who is joining us from Rome, Italy, and Chris Elders, Emeritus Professor of Geology at Curtin University, Perth, Australia. Welcome, professors, to We on World is One. I will begin with you, Professor Carlo. Explain to us the science of earthquakes and what makes Nepal so vulnerable. Uh, well, this is a very easy uh, answer because uh, India is converging relative to China about uh, four centimeters per year. And this contraction uh, determines continuous earthquakes. There are no an increase in frequency of earthquakes. We, as you said, uh, we have more tools to uh, seismometers to detect the earthquakes. Uh, but uh, the earthquake that uh, struck uh, Nepal in 2015 was 1,000 times more energetic than this one. So the problem is a cultural problem. So we need to, to build houses which can resist uh, to these uh, earthquakes, to the shaking of the ground, because uh, this earthquake will, will never last. Professor Chris, do you agree with uh, Professor Carlo that uh the region or the world will become more vulnerable in the coming years, in the coming weeks, in the coming months. And what do we need to do to get prepared? Yeah, well, as uh, Professor Carlo said, uh, the, the, what, what has happened isn't any different to what has happened in the past, that earthquakes happen uh, all the time. They are happening all around the world all the time. Um, it's just that uh, larger earthquakes and earthquakes that occur nearer to centers of population attract our attention. So perhaps it seems to us sometimes that they're um, becoming more frequent or, or larger. But the um, event in, in Nepal was one that uh, would, be, would be expected, and there will be many more similar events to that in, in the future, just as there's been many uh, similar events to that in, in the past. Professor Chris, staying with you, Australia is also susceptible to earthquakes. What have you been able to study over the years um, to explain the recurring earthquakes, especially in Australia? Yes, so um, Australia does have quite a large number of earthquakes each year. Uh, they're generally much, much smaller. So the largest earthquake that's um, affected Australia or been recorded in Australia is magnitude um, 6.2 and there's only um, one earthquake that's um, caused a fatality or caused fatalities. That was in uh, Newcastle uh, on the east coast of Australia about um, 45 to 50 uh, years ago. So uh, they, they're, they're common. Uh, that Australia is a vast country and uh, many very remote areas. So a lot of the earthquakes occur in places where people don't, uh, don't feel them. Those that do occur nearer to cities, um, it gives everyone a surprise when the um, buildings begin to shake a little bit, but generally the size of the earthquakes is such that the, uh, the damage is relatively uh, limited. Professor Carlo, some would say that climate change is to blame for the recurring earthquakes. What do you say? Uh, well, uh, it's a difficult um, question. I, the earthquakes are generated by tectonic plates which move uh, one past each other related to uh, 
pressure and uh, forces which are unrelated uh, to to atmosphere the atmosphere can modify slightly modify the gravitational field but only in a tiny way so it's difficult to say whether there is a control in climate change. I, I think I mostly would say no, in the sense that, that there may be an acceleration when you have a larger load of snow, for example, or larger um, floods, which may inhibit uh, the friction on the faults. But that's uh, a minor issue relative to what is the recurrence of earthquakes. I, I don't think uh, there is a clear relationship. Professor Carlos, still with you, uh, India, and especially the capital, uh, New Delhi, has been experiencing tremors. When Nepal experiences earthquakes, that force is experienced and felt in over 600 kilometers away from the epicenter, which is India. Should the Indian government be worried, and what should it do to be better prepared in the future? Well, most of this shaking of the ground occurs in the epicentral area. So it's uh, in the foothills of the, in the, in the Himalayas. And uh, so we know that uh, as we move away, there is a rule to watch uh, the equations that we call ground motion prediction equation. Uh, which are related to the um, energy absorption of the of the crust and the mantle uh, beneath India, for example. So as we move away, clearly the shaking decreases because an earthquake is energy. The largest is the energy, the largest is the shaking. So we, we know that uh, even remote uh, shaking or relative to the epicenter may generate uh, damages uh, if there is, for example, an amplification of the soil. So what we call microzonation studies, uh, for example, it's, it's very famous uh, what occurred in, uh, uh, New, in, uh, in Mexico, in the, in the capital, in an earthquake that occurred 300 kilometers away that generated the collapses of several big uh, skyscrapers and um, many houses because of the amplification of the ground. Professor Chris, coming to you, we've seen the devastation of earthquakes in the past. We've seen the devastation in Turkey. We've seen the devastation in Syria. We've also seen the devastation in Nepal. In 2015, over 12,000 people died. But uh, the real question is, what are governments doing to, you know, get better prepared if another earthquake uh, happens? Because some critics would say governments have not done enough to, you know, prepare their people in terms of crises. Do you agree? Well, it, uh, that's, um, again, a very difficult question to, uh, to answer, particularly in general terms, but it's, it's, it's clear what steps uh, governments can take. Um, although obviously um, implementing those things can sometimes be uh, very challenging. But the first thing, as uh, Carlo was just uh, explaining, is to understand the, uh, the risk, how, how the ground shakes, how the ground moves, and how the energy from earthquakes will be transmitted from places where they're likely to occur uh, to the surrounding areas. So we know where earthquakes are likely to occur, and we can assess the risk of damage um, in areas um, round about. So that's the that's the first important thing to know. Secondly, when 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 you know that, then obviously the um, appropriate building codes can be um, enacted to make sure that any new buildings at least are going to be um, able to withstand what is perceived to be the uh, to be the risk. Enforcing that obviously can sometimes be be a challenge and to apply that to buildings that um, already exist um, is, 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 is also, also a challenge, very, very um, difficult to sort of retrofit buildings in that particular regard. So I think there's um, uh, a limit to what governments can do, but the important thing is to understand the risk and be prepared um, in places where we know that the risk is relatively, uh, relatively high. So here comes the hardest question for both of you. Why is it hard 
to predict earthquakes. Professor Carlo, do you want to go first? Well, first of all, I, I fully agree with what uh, Professor Chris uh, has already said. And um, about uh, earthquake prediction is because uh, of uh, several reasons. One is that the um, uh, rupture generation is a chaotic phenomenon, so it's not that easy to predict. Second is uh, we don't have enough uh, um, infrastructures to monitor uh, what is uh, the heart uh, um, um, breathing or giving us the, the, the parameters. We don't probably know enough uh, the earthquake generation. We still don't know why plate, tectonic plates move, so it's a lot of uh, science to do yet, uh, to arrive to predict earthquakes, really a, a good prediction, which can resist to statistical tests. All right, what about you, Professor Chris, and uh, make it brief. Yes, no, that, that's exactly right. I think the, um, the other thing is that uh, we don't know what the um, signals are before an earthquake occurs. There, there really are very few, few. The earthquakes happen suddenly and catastrophically without any warning. So if there aren't any warning signs, it makes it very difficult to uh, predict exactly when it will come. We know earthquakes will occur, we know where they'll occur, but it's just very difficult to say exactly when they're going to occur. All right, I've been talking to Professor Carlo Doglioni, who is the president of the Geophysical Institute and Chris Elders, who is the Emeritus Professor of Geology at Curtin University, Perth, Australia. Professors, thank you very much for talking to us and for talking to We On World is One today. Thank you.